know how it is when you plan a trip on a map and in, in two dimensions the route may seem really easy, but then you get into real life, right? And, and three dimensions in that straight line may turn out to be, you know, a steep climb over a mountain range or you may run into road closures or traffic jams or flooding, right? Uh, I mean, you could have vehicle problems, a blown tire, an overheated engine. And so just to say that maps never show the full story of what lies ahead. But I think, I think that a lot of us as, as Christians, we tend to look at the Christian life from that sort of map level perspective. I mean, what I mean is once we receive the, the gift of eternal life through faith in Christ, I mean, I think sometimes there's just this expectation that it's going to be an easy path. I mean, Proverbs 3, 6, right? If, in all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. But straight doesn't always mean easy, right? Uh, or you think of maybe Romans 8, 31, where Paul says, if God is for us, who can be against us? Right? But when Paul says that, he's talking about the eternal destiny of a true believer, or that it's secure. He doesn't mean that the journey is free from difficulties. In fact, a few late few verses later in Romans 8, he talks about some of those difficulties. He talks about believers facing tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, and the sword. And then, of course, Jesus was very clear that his followers would face opposition, intense opposition. But what happens when we encounter those hard times? I mean, we have this tendency to respond with frustration and sometimes bitterness and, and even anger. Um, now, maybe some of that's because sometimes people have been misled by false teaching, you know, like the prosperity gospel, that, where you think that if you just have enough faith that those sorts of things won't happen to you. Or, or other times people um, maybe have a misunderstand the teaching about the end times, and maybe they expect that, that there really won't be hard times until after the rapture or something uh, or, or i think some people just think god must be punishing them right well look we, we've been t- going through this letter to the thessalonians and you'll remember that the thessalonians were relatively new believers uh, they had accepted the gospel and as we've seen they were waiting for jesus but, you know, they weren't naive about the road ahead. They, they expected the difficulties to come. Now, like we talked about from Acts, it, it kind of sounds like Paul maybe only had a few weeks uh, with these people before he had to move on. And, and so he must have prepared them to face the various forms of spiritual opposition that would come their way. Because as he writes to them here in, in uh, second, or 1 Thessalonians 2, 13 through 20, they seem to be standing firm uh, because he, he commends them. And as he does so, I, I think we can draw out three resources that we as believers need to use in order to withstand spiritual opposition. Now, these resources, as we make our way down through the passage, I think they'll be familiar to you. Uh, I mean, they're beliefs that God's given us uh, to counteract the different sources of opposition that we face. But I, I think as we examine them, we might find that you're, it's not, it may be something that you're not really utilizing, that you're not really relying upon. Now, maybe that's because you don't realize the sort of opposition that we face as believers. Or maybe it's because, you know, there's, there's other things that we think will help us stand firm, uh, but they don't really have the power of God behind them. So to, to stand firm in our faith as we encounter difficulties, we need to draw our strength from the Lord. And these are the, some of the resources that he gives us. First of all, the first resource is is the word of God. Now, of course, with the weather, we had to move a bunch of our equipment from outside to inside this week. And, you know, when we, whenever we do that, whenever we set up outside or make the move back inside, there's a lot of things that we have to connect. And um, so there's, there's microphones and instruments, you know, there's uh, 
soundboard amplifiers speakers and uh, and then of course we try to live stream right so there's a camera and a computer internet connection all of that uh, and so it's not surprising that with all of that that we might miss something right <laughs> that it might not work and that tends to happen uh, and when that does happen, I know for me, my mind starts racing, and I think of all these kind of minute technical things that it could be, but so often you find it's something really obvious, like you just forgot to plug in the electrical, you know, the extension cord or something. We had that happen last week outside. Uh, and so never overlook the obvious when things are not working. Now, for us as believers... That obvious starting point, that connection that we need to make is with the Word of God, right? That is the primary power source that God gives us to know Him and to, uh, and to grow spiritually. It's, it's the Word of God. And so take a look here at 1 Thessalonians 2, 13. Here's how Paul talks about it. He says, We also thank God constantly for this, that when you received the Word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. Now, before we jump to any conclusions, it's interesting to think about what Paul had in mind when he talked about the word of God. Because these believers probably didn't have access to any copies of the Old Testament. There may have been uh, some from Jewish background who, who had passages of Scripture memorized. Um, but if we go back to chapter 1 in verses 5 and 6, you may remember there Paul talked about uh, his preaching of the gospel to them as uh, the word that they had received, that they had accepted. So he's kind of building on that idea here. They accepted his teaching as authoritative revelation from God. Now, of course, later on, right, believers recognize the documents written by Paul, some of the documents written by Paul, the apostles and, and other people associated with them as inspired by God and then uh, gathered those writings together in, in what we call the New Testament, right? And, and this letter to the Thessalonians, in fact, was one of the earliest le New Testament books that was written. And so when we refer to the Word of God, and I think we can apply this verse this way, today we're talking about both the Old and New Testament, right? So Paul recognized that it was that revelation from God, that God's Word, that was working in these people. And that's such an important idea, that, that the Word, God's revelation, has an inherent energy to it. It has a creative power. Think back to, to Genesis 1. How did God bring the universe into existence? Step by step of creation, it happened as God spoke, right? And so it shouldn't surprise us that, uh, that the written account of God's revelation would exert a transforming power in people's lives. David recognize that in the old testament psalm 19 verses 7 through 8 he said the law of the lord is perfect reviving the soul the testimony of the lord is sure making wise the simple the precepts of the lord are right rejoicing the heart the commandment of the lord is pure enlightening the eyes and so when we come to the the new testament i think that spiritual power of god's word is even more clear i mean in romans 1 paul talks about the gospel as the power of God for salvation. Right? Peter says that in 1 Peter 1 that we're born again through the, the living and abiding word of God. And then he talks about it like, like milk for a newborn baby. It helps us grow. It helps us mature. Paul says it's in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete equipped for every good work. Right? So that's the power of the Word of God. So what could possibly oppose that? Well, look again at verse 13 there, back in 1 Thessalonians 2. I think if you, if you, if you think about it for a moment and, and read what he says there, 
the idea here is that we face constant opposition from within our own deceitful hearts. Right? Because our hearts tell us the lie that the word of God, yeah, that's nothing more than the word of man. Right? We think it's just a word on a page, that it's just traditions, that it doesn't have any inherent power or authority. At least that's what we can tell ourselves. And so what we, we do is we assume that we have the wisdom in, intuitively to discern whether God's word is true or not. We place ourselves as judge over it. Right? That, that, that append, independent approach to knowledge traces all the way back to the Garden of Eden. Right? You remember the story before Eve ate the, the, from the forbidden tree, she decided first to ignore God's instructions about it. She decided to, to trust her own personal evaluation of whether the tree was good for food, a delight to the eyes, and desirable to make one wise. Right? And so she chose, chose her opinion over God's. Right? That was a foolish choice it plunged all of humanity into this state of 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 sinfulness and condemnation and sickness and death and so we face this opposition in our spiritual lives as believers we face this opposition from that residual of sin that we still have in our heart how do we how do we escape from the destructive paths down which it leads us we go back to the word, right? We have to accept the word of God for what it truly is, to believe that it's completely true, that it has all authority and power. And so that's what should motivate us to, to seek to know it and to understand it, right? Then we allow it to, to shape what's important to us, our values to direct our choices, and to judge our thoughts and our intentions. We have to trust that, that the Spirit of God will use it to change us. So that's, that's the first resource. It's the Word of God. Right? Are you relying upon the Word? Are you withstanding that opposition that we face from our own hearts? That leads into a second resource, and it's the justice of God. Now, think for a moment. Would you rather have a referee or a judge? I mean, a referee is directly involved in the game, right? I mean, when he notices someone breaking the rules, he blows his whistle, he intervenes immediately, um, a penalty is handed out. And then the game carries on. And of course, sometimes you can get away with things when the referee is not looking, right? But a judge is different. A judge doesn't intervene in a moment when things are happening. A judge doesn't consider the, the case until after the event, events have occurred, sometimes long after. And what does he do? He reviews evidence from a variety of sources. He hears arguments from both sides. And so you might wait a long time for justice from a judge. And so it's interesting when you think about it. You know, a lot of religions relate to their gods as referees in the game of life. What I mean is they just try to keep them happy to avoid penalties, right? And, and I think some people even try to relate to the God of the Bible that way, but that's not how he's described in Scripture. I mean, if he were a referee, we would have been thrown out of the game already, right? I mean, that's, that's the fact, because a referee can't show grace. And so we can be thankful that the one true God of the Bible reveals himself to be a perfect judge, Right? He promises to bring ultimate justice in the future. And yet, when we believe by his grace, he accepts the sacrificial death of, of Christ as the full payment for our sins, and he declares us to be righteous. Now, you might assume 
that, you know, once you're saved, God's justice is maybe no longer relevant. It's like, well, I've dealt with that. I can, I can move on. Right? But the thing is, here in 1 Thessalonians, Paul speaks about God's justice as a vital resource that will help us, under, help us withstand opposition. Take a look at verses 14 through 16. He says, for you brothers became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea. For you suffered the same things from your own countrymen as they did from the Jews. And he continues and says, who, who killed both the Lord Jesus and the prophets and drove us out and displeased God and oppose all mankind by hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles that they might be saved so as always to fill up the measure of their sins but wrath has come upon them at last. So the Thessalonians, stepping back from, from the verse there for a second, they were facing opposition from people, right? They were facing opposition from their fellow countrymen. And of course, if we go back to Acts 17, it tells us there that uh, when Paul was, was in the city, uh, when he first preached the gospel there, a mob attacked the house of one of the believers, a man named Jason. And they brought charges against him before the, the local authorities. And Paul had to, to leave the area to help things to calm down. But it seemed like that animosity must have still continued to simmer there. And so Paul explains here that, you know, their suffering that they were experiencing is really just consistent with the history that we see uh, th throughout the Bible, right? That the, the churches in Judea experienced it from the Jews, right? In fact, Paul was part of that, right? He, he, he was carrying out some of that persecution before his conversion. Uh, but that animosity then is consistent with what Jesus faced, right? His crucifixion was orchestrated by the Jewish council in Jerusalem, and they, it was carried out by the Roman government, but even before that, he mentions the prophets. If we look in the Old Testament, and the prophets faced uh, threats and persecution. Some were even martyred. And so all that to say, there's this expectation here that Christians shouldn't be surprised to face opposition from unbelieving people. Right? When we look out at the world, there are several governments that actively oppose Christianity. And then there are places where believers face rejection and intense animosity from neighbors and family members. And Jesus, Jesus anticipated that. He, he said it would be this way. In, in Matthew 10, 25, he says it's enough for the disciple to be like his teacher and the servant like his master. If they've called the master of the house Beelzebul, how much more will they malign those of his household, right? Likening Jesus to, to Satan. And yet, I want to say this, though, though we should expect such treatment, I think maybe some American Christians have a distorted view of persecution. I mean, since Christianity played such a dominant role in our society in the past, some people act as if any limitation of that influence constitutes a vicious attack. And so what do they do? They demand their rights. You know, they pursue court cases, maybe even boycott businesses or something like that, and, and all in, in really this attitude of anger and condescension. And what happens when they do that? Does it just kind of quiet things down? No, it provokes more opposition. And so it kind of it seems to me that Peter maybe had that sort of conduct in mind in 1 Peter 4. Verses 14 through 15, he says, If you're insulted for the name of Christ, you're blessed, because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. Right, that last one's interesting. Because I wonder if people are facing persecution in the U.S. for, for Christ, for speaking the gospel, or just for being a meddler in culture and, and fighting some kind of culture war. You know, Christ's followers are, are not called to moralize society, but to preach the gospel to the lost. Those are different things. So as Paul says here in 1 Thessalonians 2.16, our focus should be on speaking to people 
that they might be saved. And, and the Jews who were persecuting him and the other apostles, that's what they were trying to do. They were trying to hinder that proclamation of the gospel. But how did Paul respond to that? Did they respond with hatred or animosity? No, I mean, Peter, in, in the verse we just mentioned a moment ago, he, he spoke accounting it as a blessing. So how, how can a Christian respond that way? That's where we come back to the justice of God. It's the justice of God that enables us to speak the gospel in love and to endure persecution with joy. Because you look there at 1 Thessalonians 2.16 and Paul recognized that his opponents were, what does it say, filling up the measure of their sins. Right? He was confident that they would experience God's wrath. For what they had done. So there's this fundamental idea that we're supposed to hold on to that the judge will ultimately rule against those who oppose the gospel. And so if we believe that, if we understand that God is the judge, then it's, it's going to lead to some different things in our life, some different responses first. I mean, we should be grateful that he's opened our eyes to believe. But secondly, we should feel this sense of compassion for those who are still blindly hurling toward that judgment. Right? When, when they oppose us, they, they're opposed to God. And then third, we should focus on reaching people with the gospel, right? Because that's the power that we just talked about a moment ago. That can open their eyes. It can cause them to be bored again. And then finally, if we're mistreated for the sake of Christ, then we can be content to leave all vengeance in the hand of God. Right? Paul talks about that at the end of Romans 12. Right? That we don't have to, to fight evil with evil, that we can overcome evil with good and trust judgment to God. One more resource, and it's the return of Christ. Every race has a finish line. I don't know if you've watched any of the Olympic trials that are going on right now. And I watched this race yesterday where uh, these women, young women were pushing themselves so hard to run a 10K race till at the end, I mean, one of them falls down and has to have medical treatment. Right? But she made it on the team. I mean, she pushed herself that hard. And how, how do runners do that? How can they push through the weariness and exhaustion? I mean, they were in Oregon. It was like, you know, 85, 90 degrees while they're running. They know that there's a finish line, right? They have the finish in view. They know that there will be an end. And they look forward to crossing that line and celebrating of seeing friends as they complete the race. And so for us as Christians, the return of Christ is, is the finish line. Right? That's, that's when our battle with our stubborn hearts will be over. That's when the justice of God will be carried out against those who oppose the gospel. And Revelation 20 also tells us that it's when the Lord will bind Satan and, and remove his destructive influence from the earth. And just so, of course, Satan is a, a fallen angel who rebelled against God and actively opposes his work. And since the Garden of Eden, he's, he's tempted people to disobey God. Right? He was there with Eve. Or then we look at, like the opening chapter, uh, chapters of Job and and see that Satan comes before God to accuse believers and to seek permission to afflict them with trials. And in Job, it talks about him orchestrating natural disasters, um, controlling unsaved people who attack Job's family, and then inflicting physical illness upon Job. Elsewhere in the scripture, it tells us that Satan inspires false religions and ideologies opposed to God, just to keep people blinded to the truth. 
So whether we realize it or not, we have a, a true enemy in Satan. And so Paul refers to his opposition here in verses 17 through 18 of 1 Thessalonians 2. He says, But since we were torn away from you, brothers, for a short time in person, not in heart, we endeavored the more eagerly and with great desire to see you face to face because we wanted to come to you. I, Paul, again and again, but Satan hindered us. Now, it's interesting. He doesn't explain how Satan hindered him from coming. Now, he was Satan, we could argue that Satan was certainly the instigator, instigator behind that hostile mob in Thessalonica uh, that drove Paul out the first time. But there could have been other ways that he was at work hindering Paul. I mean, later uh, in Paul's ministry in 2 Corinthians 12, Paul talks about this thorn in the flesh. He calls it a messenger of Satan that was buffeting him or harassing him. You know, scholars aren't sure exactly what he means by that, if it was a physical sickness or just a difficult person. Um, but maybe whatever that was, maybe it was already afflicting Paul and, and preventing him from getting back to Thessalonica. But Paul draws comfort in the midst of that hindrance from Satan by looking ahead. Look at verses 19 through 20, he says, For what is our hope or joy or crown of boasting before our Lord Jesus at his coming? Is it not you? For you are our glory and joy. What's he saying there? Well, Paul's confident that Satan's efforts will ultimately fail, that both he and the Thessalonian believers will persevere to the end and will be reunited before Christ. And furthermore, their perseverance, their presence in eternity, will confirm that his missionary efforts, that all of his labor and hardship, that they weren't in vain. And so he talks about them as this, as this crown of boasting. Now, he doesn't mean that, that he'll boast in his own efforts, you know, that he'll walk around eternity saying, look what I did, all right? Because he says elsewhere, far be it for me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. His, his boasting will still be in the Lord because it's the Lord who saved the Thessalonians. But the idea is just that, that their presence there will cause Paul's joy to just overflow. And so it's interesting, you know, there's, there's other places in the New Testament where it, it uses that kind of terminology, talking about uh, eternal life and this idea of, of receiving a crown. Paul talks about it in 2 Timothy 4, 8. He says, there's laid up for me the crown of righteousness that the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearance. We go to James. James chapter 1, verse 12 says, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. And even as, as Peter talks to uh, elders of, of the church in 1 Peter 5, 4, he says, When the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. So we're all in a race, right? That's what the Christian life is. And we have an enemy that's trying to trip us up, trying to discourage us, trying to get us to give up. But with our faith and hope set in Christ, we have this assurance that we will be victorious, that we will endure to the end and reach the finish line, right? that we'll receive the prize that will be crowned with righteousness, with the righteousness of Christ, with eternal life, with glory. And yet we get this extra point here that that joy will be all the sweeter when we're reunited with people that, that we've helped come to faith or grow in the faith. And so we should be laboring to bring other people along with us to that great hope. And so 
we need to keep the return of Christ, right? To keep the prize, to keep the reward in focus, because that gives us strength to persevere. So every believer faces spiritual opposition. You have to recognize that. Some of it's internal, our own hearts. Some of it may come from, from people around us. But also Satan seeks to hinder our growth and our service to God. And yet God has given us these resources, his word, right? The, the confidence in his justice. And in the, the reward that he'll grant us at the return of Christ. Now, I don't know, maybe for some of you that's an entirely foreign outlook. Right? That maybe that's something you've never really thought about. Maybe you've been unaware that there are spiritual realities beyond just our physical existence, right? That God exists, that there's Satan, that, that there's such a thing as sin, judgment, and salvation. And so if that's where you're at today, I would encourage you to accept, or to begin to accept the Word of God. To let it shape your outlook and your understanding of life. Begin to read the Bible and learn about the good news that, that Jesus purchased forgiveness for us through his death and resurrection. In light of what we talked about today, a great place to read along those lines would be 1 Corinthians chapters 1 and 2, where Paul talks about the power of the gospel. And then if you are a believer, then my question is, how are you doing in running the race? Are you drawing upon those resources? Are they significant to you? You know, are you, are you connecting with the word of God? Are you living in light of God's justice and willing to entrust all judgment to him? We don't have to fight those battles. And just trust him. Are you looking forward to Christ's return and living for that? I mean, maybe you know someone who just needs to hear the word, but you fear rejection. And we need to take that risk to begin to share the truth of the gospel. I mean, you could be the one who leads them to eternal life. You'll get to share in that joy when they cross the finish line. May the hope of Christ fill us all.